Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 196. For this one, we're at Aria. We're playing 5, 10, 20. It's uncapped. And uh, it is a big game. And there are a lot of huge, uh, huge pots, huge bluffs. You guys are gonna love it. This is one of the videos that I've been excited to put together for a while. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Today, we're driving past our normal spot to go just a little bit further down Las Vegas Boulevard to Aria. I haven't spent a lot of time at this property, but the poker room is one of the nicest in town and there's always a ton of action. We're still planning to play 510 like we usually do, but the game plays a little differently here than it does at Bellagio. The reason for that is it's a 3K max buy-in as opposed to a $1,500 cap. Starting out with a deeper stack of 300 big blinds instead of 150 magnifies the wins and losses, plus it tends to attract more skilled opponents. I'm in for the max, and the table looks to be pretty difficult. Ordinarily, I'd game select better. Today, I'm in the mood to test myself and try to improve by battling against tougher competition. We begin the session around 10 p.m. About 45 minutes in, we've got Queen Jack suited and the under the gun straddle. We've officially turned this into a three blind game, and it's now uncapped 5, 10, 20. Several people have bought in or added on for large amounts. There are a few stacks between 15 and 30,000. This is no kitty game. The button raises to 60. I defend for 40 more. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes 10 7 deuce rainbow. We've got two overs and some backdoor draws. I check to the pre flop aggressor. He's not giving us a free card. He makes a tiny bet of 30. It may seem like I don't have much. There's no way I can fold for this amount though. I call. The turn is the three of clubs. We pick up the flush draw. I check. This time, the opponent checks back. We see a free river. It's the ace of clubs giving us a second nuts. If my opponent was a recreational player, I'd bet my flush because I wouldn't want to check and have it get checked back. In this case, my opponent is a pro who knows that an ace is better for his range than it is for mine when I call a pre-flop raise from the straddle. I check, expecting the button to fire somewhat regularly. He doesn't disappoint us here. He bets 110. We've made a sneaky backdoor flush. This doesn't happen that often. When it does, I want to squeeze every drop of value that I can out of my opponent, particularly when I've checked three streets. I raised a 500. It's possible that my opponent doesn't have anything. It's also possible that he'll have a hand like Ace-King, Ace-10, or Ace-7. I don't anticipate him having a flush since he probably would have fired again on the turn if he had clubs. It appears that he must have something because he's tanking for quite a while. A minute goes by before the opponent folds. After a nice run out, we get the win. Had I raised less on the river, perhaps I may have gotten called and made even more. I don't mind going for the home run too much, though. A half hour later, we've got Ace Jack suited in the straddle. The cutoff raises to 50. This is the same opponent that we faced in the previous hand. I call for 30 more. Once again, we're heads up out of position. The flop comes Queen 10 9 with two spades. We've got an open ender and one over. If we drill a non spade king, we'll have the nuts. I check. The cutoff bets 30. Raising or calling seems fine. I'm getting a good price. I call. The turn is the ace of diamonds, giving us top pair to go along with our draw. I check. The cutoff doesn't check back. He bets 80. I'm not going anywhere for that amount. I call the 80, looking to improve or at least get to showdown cheaply. The river is the five of hearts. It's a complete blank. I check. It's the cutoff's turn to go for the home run. He bets 440. This puts me in a tough spot. The opponent and I both know that this is a board that's great for his range. He can have a few more sets than I'll have but I've got really good card removal, making it less likely that I'll be up against a straight, a set of aces, or two pair. Spades and diamonds both missed. If I didn't have the jack, I'd fold. Here, I call with the best one pair hand that I'll ever have. We get some bad news. The opponent flopped the straight with king jack offsuit and strung us along for two streets before going for the jugular and getting me good on the river. I'm annoyed at myself for paying off the last bet. I've got some work to do to get unstuck. Not long after, we get involved with jack ton of hearts and the hijack. I raised a 50, under the gun calls with a very short stack, he's one of the only recreational players at the table. We're heads up in position, the flop comes ace king jack with two clubs, the opponent checks. I take a $40 stab at it with bottom pair and a straight draw. With all Broadway cards out there, this is a much better board for us since we didn't get 3 bet preflop. Under the gun calls, the turn is the jack of diamonds giving us trips. The player checks, there's no way that we're checking back, I bet 200 to charge flush draws and hands containing an ace. If the opponent is holding an ace, he may think that I'm betting larger to get him off a chop in the scenario that we both have two pair and a king kicker. Under the gun calls, leaving himself with only 140 behind. The river is the queen of hearts, it gives us a straight, but I don't love it since the straight we have is obvious and it could be tougher for us to get additional value than it would have been if the river was a blank. Under the gun checks, occasionally, 
You just have to dig deep and go for it by ripping it in for massive amounts when you don't even have the nuts. This is one of those occasions. I grab chips and announce that I'm on. Okay, I only grabbed two chips and the all-in is for 140 effective, but it's still very exciting stuff. We don't get snap called, indicating that we have the winner, the player's thinking about it. Ultimately, the all-in is too intimidating, the opponent folds, we win a medium-sized pot to inch closer towards the even mark, I let the opponent see that we had him beat from at least the turn on. Next, we've got pocket aces in the hijack. I raised a 50. My friend Aaron, who's an extremely good player, but also a complete maniac, three bets of 200 from the button. That's not a typo in his starting stack. He actually has 30,000 in front of him. You may remember Aaron from previous vlogs. He once gave me 800 to play 1020 for my first time ever at Bellagio. We also went to Houston together a few years back and he bought a stuffed animal giraffe from me for $1,000. He's always happy to do kind of wild things to make videos more interesting, including aggressively three betting me. He's done it quite a few times this session already in hands when I couldn't call. I'm not calling this time either. I four bet to 700. Aaron has a terrible hand that he should have never gotten involved with in the first place. He announces a fold, mostly because for some reason, he thinks that I'm not filming. Listen closely to the table talk, it's pretty interesting. It's on, of course. Huh? Uh, what? Yeah, it's on, it's on. No, I've already, I've already pulled it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really not? It's why would it not be on? I don't know, I, that's why I asked first. It's always on. Yeah. I mean, I definitely just, would've... these are not two cards you want to be. Let, let's see a flop. Let's see what the flop would've been if I hypothetically would've played this hand. But I was really doubled yeah, right off for it. sure. Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no. That would've been so gross. Oh my God. Yeah, uh, Jesus. Classic. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta see the run out. Yeah. Sure, let's see the run out. Let's see the run out. There's no shot. No shot. Yes. Aaron would have flopped bottom two pair if he called. I would have gotten bailed out on the river with the board pairing the queen. We for sure would have gotten it all in on either the flop or the turn since I wouldn't have had much behind if he'd called the $700 four bet. I'm almost back to even when I pick up ace-king offsuit in the cutoff about 10 minutes later. I raised a 50, the button wants to go to war, he three bets a 210. He's a different opponent from my buddy Aaron, the button doesn't three bet too frequently, he's still gonna get the same treatment as my friend though, I four bet to 700 in order to lay down the law. These types of situations are somewhat uncomfortable because if I get five bet jammed on, I'm not gonna be too thrilled. Instead, the button folds, this isn't a huge pot, still, I'm glad to take it down without making a pair, this one gets us all the way above the even mark for the session, we're up 200 at the moment. Here we pick up queen deuce of diamonds in the straddle. Aaron raises to 50 in middle position. Call the authorities. There's about to be some friend on friend crime. I call for 30 more. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes ace 10 deuce with two clubs and one diamond. We've got bottom pair and some backdoor draws. I check. We face an instant $30 bet. I consider check raising as there are a lot of cards that can help me out on future streets. But instead I call with plans of possibly check raising the turn. That's what I usually do against Aaron with big hands anyway. The dealer puts out the six of diamonds, giving us a flush draw. I check. Aaron blasts away for 450. It's about two and a half times the size of the pot. Being out of position against this dude is no fun. I played with him since I first moved to Las Vegas in 2012. I've seen him make similar plays with a lot of drawing type hands, especially gut shot straight draws. I'm worried that if I call in brick, Aaron will bet big again on the river and I'll have to fold. I honestly don't think that he'd bet this much if he had a set or two pair or even top pair. I haven't been in this situation too many times in my life. I'm not 100% sure what to do. Because the opponent and I have a decade of history, I take a very obscure line and raise to 1100 as a semi-bluff. I probably play sets of 10s and deuces this way, as well as ace 10, ace 6, and ace deuce suited. Aaron knows that I like to take advantage of his aggression by trapping him and he's understandably perplexed. He gets changed for one of his 5k chips from a neighbor. He doesn't appear to want to fold. I only have about 2000 behind. If he has anything decent, he's going to jam on me. Instead. He just flats, somewhat strengthening my suspicion that he's on a draw. It's likely a good one though. Perhaps he has a combo draw like king-queen, king-jack, or eight-seven of clubs. I just really want to hit a diamond. Another deuce would be even better. Sometimes in life, we don't get what we want though. The dealer puts out the jack of hearts. We completely brick everything. I have a few thoughts going through my head right now. The first is, why did I get myself into this situation? The second is, I'm not 100% sure a bluff attempt will get through if my opponent was trapping me or somehow connected with the jack to make a straight or two pair. My third thought is that I've got a pair so I don't necessarily have to continue bluffing because I could be good if Aaron also missed a draw. I check, really wanting to see a check back. And guess what? We get it. 
I turn my hand over, thinking there's about a 50-50 chance that we're best. Is it good? Yeah, it's fucking good. This is so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. See it, Aaron. What do you want from me? Wait, wait to the camera. Are you slow rolling me? I feel like you're slow. It's good. Push in the pot. It's good. Put your cards back. Aaron shows for the vlog that he had king nine of clubs for a missed flush draw. Him and I are good enough friends that it wouldn't be out of the realm for him to slow roll me. He's done similar things in the past, which is why I was so adamant about him mucking his cards before being able to enjoy the win. That was a bizarre hand in which we somehow get the maximum. I go over it with Nick Petrangelo later, who said it was okay, probably just to be nice. He spends a lot of time in Canada where their politeness could have rubbed off on him. He also added that check raising the flop or flatting the turn bet are reasonable plays as well. Winning this pot puts us up 1300 on the night. That's a nice profit. About five minutes later, we're dealt jack 10 of diamonds on the button. I raised a 50. The small blind is the only caller. We're heads up in position. The flop comes a6-4 with two diamonds. In my range, I'll have all the sets and a lot of two pair combos that the small blind shouldn't have, plus ace-king and ace-queen. Since it's such a better flop for us, we have a big draw. I bet pot, making it 130. I don't really mind getting a call or a fold. The small blind calls. The turn is the eight of spades. No help to us. The small blind checks. I keep the pressure on with a bet of 400. At this point, I prefer to see a fold. We don't get it, the small blind calls. I'm not too upset because the river is the nine of diamonds, we've got the third nuts. I'm gonna bomb it, except I don't get the chance. The small blind leads for 1100. It feels like he has a flush of some sort. I'm not sure if his is better than mine or not. It doesn't really matter since it's not gonna affect my decision. I call. This is when what the opponent has does matter. He shows that he's got king three of diamonds for the absolute nuts. This one's painful. I didn't even get to enjoy having a nice stack for very long. Within 10 minutes, I get coolered and lose a big pot that causes me to be stuck 500. This prompts a trip to the cashier where I add on for another 2,000. I'm tired of having one of the shorter stacks at the table. With it being switched to a proper uncapped 5, 10, 20 game, I prefer to at least have 200 big blinds to play the style of poker that I feel most comfortable playing. I'm in for 5K total. I've got over 4,000 in front of me. An hour of being card dead goes by before we pick up pocket queens and the hijack. We're gonna be playing it. I raised a 50. Aaron, who three bet earlier and considered calling a four bet with six two suited without even having the revenge range activated, three bets here to 200. After getting him with queen deuce and him losing some big pots to some other players at the table, I can't imagine what his three bet range looks like now. It may even include five deuce offsuit. With his range being so wide, I'm gonna four bet a much wider range myself that easily contains pocket queens. I make it 700. We raised the 700. His ships get in there at the same time mine do. He's got very little regard for money at the moment. His primary objective is to wreck my world and then have me make a video of it. Despite him being incredibly wild, he's not an idiot. And sometimes he'll have a legitimate hand that ends up being incredibly strong. It's scary when that happens. We don't have this in the bag yet, especially because the flop comes King Jack 3 with two hearts. We've got second pair on a coordinated board. I don't want to check. Give control of the pot to Aaron. I down bet to 500. I do this with a set of kings and jacks. I'd also do this with aces, ace king, ace queen, and a variety of other combinations. We know that my hand isn't great, but Aaron doesn't. In fact, this board is still really good for my range, so if he was trying to get me with a smaller medium pocket pair or smaller medium suited connectors, this $500 bet should get him to abandon ship if he doesn't have hearts or maybe clubs. We don't take it down with a small bet. Aaron calls indicating that he at least has something. The turn is the eight of spades. Now I'm not sure what to do. I don't want this pot to continue getting larger. Ideally, I'd like to get to showdown as cheaply as possible. I really have one of the worst hands that I'll ever have given how this has been played so far. I check, again, I'd like to see a check back. That's not Aaron's style. He senses weakness and bets 1400. If I call, I'll have 1600 in my stack. I don't see how I'd be able to fold to a river jam. I could be drawing to two outs if I'm up against any king or a set of jacks. I'd only have one out if I'm up against king queen. He'd probably check back king queen though. I have plenty of other hands that'll do better on this board. I could be getting bluffed by a heart draw or some kind of straight draw, but I might be absolutely crushed as well. I reluctantly fold to live another day. Aaron doesn't want to show both cards this time. He shows one though, and it's nine of hearts. He might've taken a free river card with king nine of hearts. It looks like we got bluffed by a flush draw of some sort. Aaron showed the neighbor on his left mid hand what he had, and they both later tell me that it was nine seven of hearts. Aaron had a flush draw and turned a gut shot straight draw to go along with it. I got semi bluffed, but we didn't know where we were at. We needed to fade a ton of river cards. A heart was almost 100% coming to devastate me. Aaron gets me back, and now I'm down 2,000 on the night. Four minutes later, we've got pocket eights in the straddle. 
Under the gun plus one is Jamin's buddy Rain Delay. He raises to 60. I call for 40 more. We're heads up out of position. Flop comes 766 rainbow. We've got an overpair and a backdoor straight draw. Not bad. I check. The opponent down bets at 50. This flop is much better for my actual hand and my range than it should be for the opponent. Plus, the smaller the bet we're facing, the more often we'll want to check raise. I make it 250. This is a bit too large of a sizing since the hands we're trying to get to fold, which are ones containing two overs that have plenty of equity, will likely let go for less. I've risked more than I needed to with my sizing, and when I get called, I'll mostly be in bad shape. I get called in this spot and really have no idea where I'm at. The turn is the four of hearts, giving us a gutter to the straight. Despite not knowing if I'm ahead or behind, I don't like the idea of checking to give up control of the pot. Even if I don't have the best hand right now, any five or eight will likely give me the winner, so I check call a bet anyway. I'd rather stick with the aggression. I bet 400. Rain delay has a decision to make. Eventually he calls. He could certainly have a better overpair, but there's some chance that he's got a seven that he's holding on to. The river is the king of diamonds, downgrading us. I check. I'll probably just fold if the opponent bets. There's no bet this time though. Under the gun plus one checks back. I show the pocket pair. Apparently it's good enough to take down the pot. We don't get an opportunity to see what rain delay has as he tosses his cards face down in the muck. Check raising to a larger amount and then betting fairly large on the turn works out great for us this time as we happen to have gotten called by a worse hand on two streets, but in theory, we could have played it slightly better. It's nice to rake in a decent amount of chips to get back on the right track. The very next hand, we've got ace 10 suited in the big blind. There's an additional straddle on this one to 40. The button raises to 100. I should be three betting to deter players behind me from getting involved. Instead, I call for 90 more. Aaron calls from under the gun plus one for 60 more in the double straddle. We're going three ways to the flop out of position. It becomes 10-7 deuce with two diamonds. We've got a somewhat disguised top top. I check. For some reason, Aaron takes the initiative and bets 140 rather than waiting to see what the preflop aggressor wants to do. The button folds. I'll be sticking around. I call. We're heads up. The turn is the seven of clubs pairing the board. I check. If Aaron checks back, I'll be confident that I've got the best hand. He does check, so maybe he has a worse 10 or a draw of some sort. The river's another deuce. The board is paired twice. I doubt I'm up against the boat though. I bet 500 to make it look like I missed a straight or flush draw, but really I'm betting big to target 10s with the worst kicker. Aaron can't let go. He calls. I give him the bad news that I was value betting. He tosses his cards face down into the middle where there are a pile of chips that are about to be coming our way. We get close to the maximum on this one. With the win here, our stack is up to 4,600, so we're only down 400 on the night. You guys know that I don't like leaving stuck. We're gonna push through until we can book a W. At least that's the plan. A half hour goes by, then we pick up eight four clubs in the big blind. I call for 10 more. Rain delays in the straddle. He raises to 80. Let's refer to the blind versus blind preflop chart that Nick Petrangelo put together for the upswing cash game course that'll be out in a few weeks to see how we should play this hand. We'll say that I'm the small blind in this instance, and when it's not opened, I'm supposed to be limping with 8-4 suited like I did. When we face a raise from the big blind, or in our case a straddler, we should be calling with 8-5 suited and 7-4 suited. At least that's when it's a 3x raise. We're facing a 4x raise, so we should be playing potentially a little more snug than that even. But 8-4 suited isn't too far out of the suggested range. I don't have accessibility to this chart mid-hand. I make a slightly wider call than I should. We're heads up, out of position, and the flop comes king 8 four, all diamonds. We've got bottom two pair on kind of a weird board. I check. Rain delay tosses out 100. I'm conflicted on whether to check raise or not. I call a bit for deception and a bit so that this pot doesn't get out of control. If my opponent has any diamond, he'll be in decent shape against me anyway. If he has two diamonds, I'm smoked. The turn is the ace of clubs. It's better for the opponent's range. I check. Rain delay doesn't let up. He bets 320. I'm not sure if he really has a strong hand or if he's just trying to keep the pressure on since I played this passively so far. I don't see any reason to check raise at this point. I call again. The river is the jack of spades. It's another high card that's generally going to be better for the preflop raiser. I check. Maybe we can get another river checked back. Nope. Under the gun bets 560. This is a very annoying spot. Initially, I wasn't planning on folding to any bets. No more diamonds came on the turn of river. The additional Broadway cards coming out have made this more difficult for me. When the opponent bets all three streets, bottom two pair is only a bluff catcher since I don't really beat anything that he'd take this line with for value. You saw me incorrectly bluff catch early on in the session with Ace Jack. Usually when I call in these situations, I'm wrong. It's just so hard for me to let go. I tank for about a minute and 20 seconds before finally coming to a decision. I fold. Nice hand, nice hand. Rain delay doesn't show what he had, but he'd later tell me that he had me beat and I made a good lay down. 
That makes me feel better. What doesn't make me feel better is the fact that I'm currently losing $1,000 and it's getting pretty late. My dreams of getting unstuck are slowly dissipating. They're not dead though. We've got 8-6 suited in the big blind. The hijack min raises to 40. This is an odd amount. The small blind who's been 3-betting a lot makes it 120. This is another really small sizing. My sense is that neither player's all that strong. I could easily wait for a better hand to get involved, but on a scale of 1 to 10, that wouldn't be very fun. My image is good since I've only 4-bet with hands at the top of my range so far, and I haven't even 3-bet in some situations that I could have. I take advantage by putting in a cold 4-bet to 400. Usually, we'd want to do this with an ace in our hand. Today, we're living on the edge. This move will look a lot like aces, kings, queens, ace, king, and then some ace, queen, or ace, five through ace, deuce suited occasionally as bluffs. I expect it to get through for me pretty often. It doesn't this time. The hijack calls for 360 more, then the small blind calls for 280 more. This is a rare four bet multi weight pot. My perception of the hijack's min raise must have been way off. It might even be trapping with aces. If not, you could have another strong pocket pair like kings, queens, or jacks. Small blind, on the other hand, will probably never have aces. You could have other strong pocket pairs, though. We're going three ways to the flop. It comes ace, five, three with two hearts. It's pretty terrible for our actual hand, but it smashes our range, including the hands that we should have been four bet bluffing with. What doesn't do well on this flop is the hand that I actually chose to four bet bluff with. We've got nothing except a backdoor straight draw. At least any deuce, four, seven, or nine will help us improve. Small blind checks. I take a stab at it for 500 like I would if I had aces, ace five, ace king, and ace queen. You saw me also bet this amount in a four bet pot with queens on a king high board previously. My bet doesn't necessarily mean much by itself, but I'm hopeful that this could get most pocket pairs that miss sets to fold. The hijack is thinking for a very long time about what to do. It doesn't seem like he's contemplating a raise. It feels more like he doesn't want to fold a mediocre hand for only 500, but I'm not the only person that he has to be concerned about beating right now. He still has another opponent in the small blind that he has to consider. After a minute of tanking, the hijack calls. There's no reason for him to tank that long with aces if he was trapping preflop. You'd think that his decision would be easy, and he'd call somewhat quickly to continue setting the trap. Instead, the hijack at least appeared to be genuinely on the fence about whether to call or fold. I don't think that he's that good of an actor. If he is, he deserves an Oscar for nailing the subtle things that players do when they're making difficult decisions. The hijack might have something like kings or queens, and it's just calling one time for a relatively small amount to see how the rest of this hand plays. Small blind folds immediately. It's down to heads up in a pot that's already large. The turn is the queen of spades, making things very interesting. Again, I can have a ton of strong hands, including aces, queens, ace, queen, ace, five, and ace, three. After seeing my opponent tank when facing a flop bet, coupled with the fact that he didn't five bet preflop, I ruled out him having aces and significantly discounted him having ace, king because those are pretty straightforward calls to make on the flop. He probably has ace, queen suited, kings or queens. There are two combos of ace, queen suited, and there are three combos of queens that the player could have for a total of five combinations that'll never fold if I take one more shot as a bluff. Meanwhile, there are six combinations of pocket kings that my opponent will have to auto muck if I bet again. Even if my read on the flop was wrong and the opponent has ace, king, he's not going to like seeing me put more money in the pot because he'd be calling to basically chop at best. There's also some tiny chance that the hijack has a hand like jacks. 11 total combinations that are the most likely ones that my opponent will have, and me surmising that he'll fold six of them, I put in another borderline suicidal bluff attempt, announcing a bet of 1400. Yep. Take the house. What's that? 1400. It doesn't get much more interesting than this. I'm putting almost everything on the line. If we can win the pot half the time or more, it's a great play because we're risking 1400 to win 2200. I can talk about my reads on situations all day, but in reality, I'd never suggest that anyone put themselves in this position. I've invested 2300 in a hand that I had no real business being in in the first place. If I get called here, I'll have 1700 in my stack, and I'll have to shut down on the river. That means I'll be stuck 3300 on the session. I don't have too much time to consider how bad I'll feel if I lose, because the opponent snap folds, we get the Hail Mary bluff through in the clutch, our line looks like we have the nuts or something close to it, when really, we get lucky to take down a large pot with only eight high. It's difficult to put into words how relieved I am to immediately get the fold, but you can see my hand shaking as all the adrenaline is coursing through my body. This one gets us above the even mark, and that's where we're gonna stay. We've got 5,300 in front of us. I'd play for another half hour without getting involved in any more interesting hands. After getting out of the hole initially, and actually being up 1,300 for only a few minutes, then getting stuck 2,000, I'm more than happy to rack up a small win, get out of a very tough game unscathed.
played for five hours. I won $330, and that was one of the toughest games that I played in a long time. Um, it was a 5 10 20 game, uncapped, and uh, I had that queen deuce hand that worked out against my buddy Aaron. Aaron is kind of the king of putting people in really tough spots, and at this point, I knew that uh, my hourly in that game is not gonna be super high, and uh, may not even be positive, but I just wanna put myself in kind of uncomfortable situations. I wanna get better, I wanna be playing games that are bigger than this game, and I'm not gonna be ready for those games if I don't put myself um, in uncomfortable situations and try and grow as a player, so. Uh, yeah, Aaron just relentlessly three bets me and stuff. Um, he bluffed me off of Queens, put me in a really tough spot. And uh, I got flush over flush. I was down 2K at the low point. Luckily, um, my bluff attempts worked out. And uh, that 8-6 suited hand, that cold four bet with it, it was just kind of a situational thing. And it was a bit, it was, I mean, it was definitely reckless. There were some things that I, thoughts that were uh, in my favor in that hand, um, particularly the board and the fact that I hadn't cold four bet one time today and the guy to my right had been three betting quite a bit. Um, and you know, it did work out, but it could have easily gone the other way. So uh, that was fortunate. And uh, now I'm pretty tired, so I'm gonna, gonna head out of here. That's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons because it helps out the channel a ton. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comment section. I'm happy to get back to you. Uh, this session, I got extremely lucky to, to get out with a small win. Uh, that 8-6 suited bluff, not a, not a good hand overall. So when you're running well, like I have been pretty much up to this point in the vlog for the last year or so, um, you know, you get away with that kind of stuff. But from this point forward, that's not necessarily gonna be the case. I'm gonna be putting out some vlogs where I'm not getting away with these kind of shenanigans. And uh, I'm actually pretty excited to, to share that stuff with you guys. Um, in 2019, I ran really poorly. I think I won $1,000 total. I, I put together a stats video for that. And then in 2021, I ran really well. It's nice to have uh, two years kind of at the extremes and um, for and to have it documented for you guys to see uh, 2022 I mean hopefully I can I can turn it around but um, I mean there's plenty of time left obviously but not off to a super good start uh, I I will be putting together those videos in the next few weeks but um, the vlog just kind of needs to catch up to where I am right now Anyway, uh, for this video, I, I worked with an editor for the first time in five years. His name's Mike Bailey, awesome guy. He's worked in poker, um, playing poker, and making content for the last several years. And uh, he's never gotten the credit he deserves in my mind. He's one of the top poker content creators and someone that you probably haven't heard of. So let me know in the comments section if you guys like this vlog that he, that he worked on and me having an editor is gonna mean a lot more poker content from this channel. It means I'm gonna be able to play more sessions. I'm super excited about it because I was just kind of burnt out the last couple years trying to play and um, edit everything myself. I'm still writing the scripts and recording the audio, obviously, so still my personality in it, but uh, you know, Mike has a lot more experience editing and um, he's, just, he's just better at doing it, so why not use him? He, uh, he also did a promo video for The Lodge. He came out there for Monster Meetup Week and shot something. I'm gonna have a link down below uh, to that video if you wanna check out kind of what The Lodge is all about and the vibe of it. There's a Spring Mayhem series coming up. That's at the second half of February and going into March. I'll be, I'll be out there uh, for March and um, hopefully I'll see you guys there. All right, I uh, hope you're all doing well, staying safe. Good luck at the tables. I'll see you next time and uh, bye.